Um, welcome everyone who has logged on with us today. Um, this, I'm Leslie Gleaves. I'm the senior educator here at the Springville Museum of Art. We have our head of exhibitions and programs, Emily Larson, in the gallery with Liz Harris. Um, so we'll all kind of be working together with technology and making sure that things run as smooth as they can during this. So this program is part of our Artist to Artist series, um, where we connect professional artists with the classroom, whether that's in a professional development setting with teachers like this, or whether it is with your students. Um, and so more information about that can be found on our website. If you're doing this for the UEN Reimagined Teaching Credit, um, you'll need to stay through this um, presentation and there will be a survey link that I'll put into the chat um, at the end of this session that you'll fill out and that's how you'll receive your certificate to turn into UEN. Um, this will be a two hour credit class and um, we are excited today to have Liz Harris with us. She specializes in charcoal and oil in the classical tradition. And we will go ahead and turn the time over to her. Hey, thank you so much. Um, I wanna go over my materials really quickly. Um, charcoal, there are a lot of different options that you can use. And so I'm gonna show you what I use and then um, what I don't use and why I don't use it. And um, the first thing that I use is a sanding block. This is like a fine or super fine sanding block that you just buy at Home Depot. And then um, I prefer uh, willow and vine charcoal. I have a medium one. This is my, or a soft one rather, sorry. And then um, a hard one. And you can see that I've got the tape Okay, this is the soft, uh, it's a willow charcoal on the soft end, and then this is a vine charcoal on the hard. The reason that there's tape in the middle is I actually take two sticks and tape it together. So I have a nice length so that when I'm applying the charcoal, I can do it with a really unsteady hand, which gives those beautiful um, expression to the end of the drawing. And um, yeah, that's, so that's why they're taped together. I know that you can buy a baton holder, but um, I've just never spent the money to buy one. This tape is always around the house and super cheap. Um, in order to sharpen these and to get a nice fine point, um, you need a, uh, a razor blade. And so um, there are videos online. I can't find my razor blade right now. I know it's here, but online that show you going down the, um, the charcoal in order to sharpen it. And then once you've got it sharpened there, you want to, I, I hope everybody can see this. Oh, perfect, okay. You want to roll it like this as you're sharpening. And then that will give you the nice point. If you just sharpen one inch and then turn it, um, obviously you will end up with a, um, a square at the end. So that is how I sharpen the sticks. Um, I have in the past and every once in a while, I will use uh, pencils. I tend to use a 6B as my softest um, and this is General's brand, but any brand will do. So 6B in, in my softest and then um, I think I have a 2H is my hardest. Um, I limit myself to just a few pencils when I do use them, uh, just to avoid um, overcomplicating matters. You can still get a full range of values. You do not need every single pencil. Um, and then of course you need the white charcoal. I, it's not charcoal, I think it's chalk pencil. This will be for highlights, et cetera. Sometimes I've used it for blonde hair. Um, we might do that today as the model that I took the photo of is blonde. So here are these things. Um, for eraser, I use a kneadable eraser right here. I use a kneadable. Um, the paper that I work on, this, this eraser works best. I have worked on Bristol board before, Bristol paper, and that is extremely smooth and hardy. And so you could really get an art gum eraser to get in there. Um, I don't prefer the Bristol paper right now because it has, the, the kind that I was buying had no texture. 
And I prefer to have a paper with texture. And the reason that I do is that skin has texture. And so anytime that you are doing a portrait and it becomes too smooth, that's when you get that plastic look. That, that is one of the ways you can get a plastic look to the skin. So if you're looking for something or an effect that is a little more realistic, you're going to need a texture. And um, the easiest way to do that is to start with a paper that has texture. Now, you can crush the texture on the paper as you're all aware. And so you want to be really careful and not be erasing too hard nor drawing too hard and you get that um, trail left by a pencil, which is why I tend to use these. Now, towards the end, I will use a pencil. I will also use, this is a nitram stick. It's really small. I've, I've sharpened it down and used it a lot. It's a fine point razor blade as well with the um, sand block to get nice and tight into a point. And this will be those beautiful lines at the end of the drawing. I'll put the, those in with this. Um, this is blue. I think that means that it's an HB. I'm not sure. You have to see. Um, the nitram, the difference between regular uh, charcoal, these three, is that this is going to be your softest, right? And um, this, as long as it's not the 6B, you can sharpen just with the pencil sharpener, as you're well aware. And then the nitram, I don't know how they do this, what kind of magic they employ, but it's kind of compressed charcoal, I believe. But um, this tends to break a lot less than any of the other brands. So it, it, it's kind of a beautiful little piece for the end when you're pushing a little bit harder on the paper. So be careful of how hard you push on the paper anytime that you're doing a charcoal drawing. Charcoal will move a lot more like paint does, uh, which is why I use it instead of graphite. I also use it instead of graphite because graphite just takes forever to put down. And I can't always get those nice silky darks that I like um, in, in uh, just graphite. Another thing that I use are the sticks, charcoal sticks. And these you'll notice I uh, use more towards the end for texture behind the model or even in um, hair or something like that. But I do use these sticks. Um, are there any questions on the materials? Oh, the paper that I'm using is a uh, Canson Me Tint. I left the sticker on here. I don't know if you guys can see that, yeah, the sticker, because I wanted to show you, I use the back side of the paper. The opposite side is the one that you usually use for pastel. And so this is a little bit smoother. The back side is just, or what is supposed to be the front side, is just a little too much texture for my taste. And then I'd have to go back in and fill in all the little holes. So this is the side that's perfect for me. Um, I don't know if you guys can see it, but the stick curl number 343, Kansa Neatent. So that's what that is. I'll leave it right there in case you guys want to take a look. When, um, does anyone have any questions about materials? And feel free to say them out loud or type them in the chat. I'll try and scroll through and see if anyone's raising their hand or anything. Okay, I'm just gonna go on, but if you have um, materials questions, please feel free to ask them. Um, when you are photographing your model, obviously there are lots of different ways that you can do the lighting. Um, a lot of people will do, you'll see a lot of people do a flat lighting. And I've done a little bit of a flat lighting today to kind of help you with that. It is the harder lighting. You see a lot of people just take cell phone pictures and they say, oh, I love that smile of that person and everything's evenly lit across the front of the face. And that's extremely difficult, um, especially, I, you guys know, you'll have teenagers come with these impossible pictures that have no, no shadow, no light and shadow. And so that's the first thing that I do when I am uh, picking a, a drawing, uh, well, picking a photo to draw. Um, is I make sure that the light has a direction, right? Rather than just in front of me. I'm gonna show you guys something really fast. Let's 
Sorry, that's not supposed to be on there. Incidentally, that's something I never do when I'm drawing. I don't smear anything on my finger. Um, as you guys are well aware, the oils from your fingers will then mix with the charcoal and you'll have a very hard time getting it up. Also that smearing gives, uh, again, that plastic-like texture. So um, if you can refrain from smearing, you'll end up with uh, a more lifelike result. Um, if that's what you're after, you may not be after that. So um, when you are taking a picture of the model, um, let's just say we have the face right there. It's a great drawing. It's gonna show off my elliptical skills right here. Um, and let's say that you have the light coming this direction. Sorry. Oops. Coming this direction, here's the face. You're going to have the light hitting here, and then you're going to have shadow all along here. And then if it's on a surface, you're going to have a cast shadow. It comes out this way. Okay, you're all familiar with that, right? Everywhere where the light hits is the lit area, as I'm speaking to you today. And everywhere else is gonna be shadow area. And even up in here, there's gonna be, you're gonna have that core shadow. right along that edge, and it's gonna fade. Where the light hits, this lit area is going to be the lightest, but that's not your highlight, okay? And then in the lit side, all of the, the value that comes across it, or the occult, those are called the mid-tones, half-tones, whatever you wanna call them, but it's still in the lit area, okay? Now your catch light, this is, probably stuff you guys already know, but I thought we'd do a quick refresher before I get started so I can show you what I'm talking about with different things. Your catch light depends, or sorry, your catch light is in the eye. Your highlight is going to depend on where you are standing in relation to the light. So when the light hits the, um, the surface, it's going to bounce back into your eye. So your highlight is going to be in a different area than anyone else's. It might come down and then bounce into my eye here. But if I were further, let me show you a setup. Let's just say, um, here's our model, here's our light, right here, casting light, okay? And here I am standing. So as I get that little piece of light that's gonna bounce back in my eye, it might be right here. But if I'm sitting here, it's gonna bounce at a different angle and be in a different location. Does that make sense? So your, this highlight right here is very specific. It tells the viewer not only where you're standing and where the light source is, but it also describes the form underneath. If you put it in the wrong place, what you're doing is you're misdescribing the form. So a lot of people will just pop that highlight in there or the catch light in the eye or the tip of the nose and it will change the look of that form. And so you have to be very careful about where you put all of those different things. Okay. Um, so for this demonstration, the, um, the model, my daughter, I made model for me last night. She, um, we put her under different kinds of light and we ended up liking kind of this flat light. You guys see that? Actually, let me turn the light down a little bit for you. We kind of like that flat light, but look at that strong cast shadow. So just like that ball that I was showing you, the, cat, the uh, shadow underneath the ball on the table, that's what the head does to the neck, correct? So you want to make sure that you have that shadow under the neck in the right place and being the right value. Anyway, this is our model today. This is what we're gonna start with. The first thing that I do when I am drawing is I see there are three things that are really important. There's line, uh, there's value, or drawing, sorry, value, and then um, edges. 
Those are very, very important in drawing. So why is drawing number one in drawing? Because that can be line drawing, if you're better at line drawing or that's what you prefer, or shape drawing, which is kind of the way I see things. I see them in shapes and they're different puzzle shapes that, sh that fit together. So they will be the puzzle shape of the eye socket right around here. What is that specific shape and how does it fit together with the forehead shape? You're gonna see this, I'll do it on myself. Okay, see this right here? That shape right there. You see the shape as it comes across, sorry, comes across my cheek. In here, we have another shape that goes here. So it's putting all of those shapes together and making sure you've got them in the, in the right place. So that's what I'm going to start with right now. So if you guys have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them while I'm putting them in the first shapes. And Liz, if they want to follow along, they should just kind of follow what you're doing. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, is there a, can you guys see that one? I will try not to block it too much. Okay, the first thing that I do, I know a lot of people say start with like the top of the head and the bottom of the chin. I will put, um, I'm using very soft charcoal. So whatever charcoal you're using, make sure it's extremely soft. You wanna be able to get it up um, when you make a mistake. It's not if, it's when, right? So you wanna be able to, to get, it, get it up. We only use the hard charcoal at the very end. We'll smear around, but when we start putting in those really dark lines, very specific lines, it's going to be towards the end. And I'll go back with a little more soft charcoal because it's darker. Um, so I'll show you that right now. So I, I've decided I want, um, almost always, I do my hand size for uh, the face, for the head. It's just a size that works for me better. So it's something like that. These are going to be erased and they can at any, at any point be taken off the paper completely. Okay, so I've got kind of a start right here. And as I'm looking at the picture of the model, it's um, very narrow because of her, her hair, a very narrow area. So go ahead and just put that in again. Um, the next thing that I'm going to do is put in that shape of the eye socket. I may have made that a little too narrow. Now don't worry if you can see there's a lot of light coming across into that eye. Don't worry about that. We're gonna go ahead and pull it out later. Um, right now, we just want that basic shape. Um, shape is kind of the way we recognize each other. And so if you can get the shapes down, uh, then you'll get recognition, whether your lines are completely right or not. Does that make sense? Okay, everybody, does anybody have any questions about that? Um, I wanna put in kind of the top of where her hair might be. And then I'm just going to do a quick calculation of size. Yeah, bring our chin up. I'm barely touching the paper as I put down the charcoal. It is just barely on there because I want to be able to have the freedom to move it around and also erase it whenever I need to. And is that a tip you would share with students and any young people who are using charcoal for the first time? Do you feel like that's a real easy mistake students would make? Absolutely. They make that mistake all the time. The other thing that I've noticed in workshops when I've been teaching, almost always my students go from here very quickly into details without making sure that this is correct. 
you want to stay in this kind of ghost image, this kind of soft drawing as long as you can until it's absolutely perfect. So I'm just kind of, I'm doing some measurements. The, the other mistake that I see a lot in the workshops that I really think bears mentioning is that we learn this divide the face in half and that's where you put the eyes or you know a third between your eyebrow and your and your um, hairline down to the nose down to the chin that only works if the model is perfectly straight on the minute that that model changes they tilt their head back yes those measurements are still perfect but only for sculptors. For anyone who's taking a three-dimensional image and turning it into a two-dimensional image, those um, measurements are gonna change. And um, there are a few predictors, but really the students need to know that it's much harder to do anything but a straight on portrait. And they need to know also that um, everything has to line up. So as I go across, my eyebrows have to line up. My eyes, when I get the, the corners of the eyes in, um, you will have some people who uh, these corners will line up, but this side will either go down or will go up, depending on uh, lots of factors. But um, you wanna make sure that there's a straight line that is perpendicular, sorry, horizontal. Gosh, yeah, <laughs> sorry, parallel to. <laughs> Um, the eyebrows and then that same line should come down to the nose and that same line should go to the mouth and may or may not hit the chin. I know my daughter well enough to know that she's got a few features that are a tiny bit off, but if I went ahead and put, as we all do, but if I went ahead and put everything in perfectly, I could still get a likeness and it still, you know, matter. So anyway, if your students are um, doing a face that is maybe tilted back like this, you're not going to have those same measurements as they go down. And that's a, that's a mistake I see all the time, is people take that formula and then just run with it in any, any portrait that they do. I like to put in the bottom of the mouth first and then put in the crease. Um, between the lip and then this bend in the chin. I like to get that in first because usually then I can tell if I have a problem. That's just me. Um, but with this, with this kind of ghost shape, I'll keep playing around with it until I make sure that I've got kind of the right thing, which I'm not gonna take the time to do now. Um, we've got to speed up a little. <laughs> um, but I want to show you also the ball exercise that you've seen everywhere, it's an egg where the light is hitting the ball and then the shadows go around the bottom of the ball um, is exactly the same for the skull, for the face. And a lot of people um, forget that when they go to do portraits that if the light is hitting, whereas uh, for our model, it's kind of front and center, it's hitting right in this area. If the light is hitting there, then I'm going to have a natural drop off as the light goes back. So the back of the hair has got to have a little bit of shadow. Um, and then of course you'll have a little of a hairline. If they're painting, it's almost always a warmth that hits right there at that hairline. Um, but you have to have that roundedness. So what I do as well is I will come and just lightly put in a shadow that goes over the whole face because I know the light is dropping off as it goes around the ball of the head. What I mean by that too is that then I know there's a plane change here and then I know that the light is gonna to start to drop off as it goes down this way. So at about that cheekbone, um, you're going to need to add even a little bit more value in that bottom half of the face. And as you start to do that, you will all of a sudden already get that nice rounding that you need in the face. Now I've got some pretty crazy lines here. I'm gonna show you this and then we're gonna turn it over where I have a, a 
drawing that's a little further along. <clears throat> what I do if I have a line that's really sticking out or in the wrong place, instead of scrubbing it, and this is something that I would definitely teach your students, work with it. It's like when you're working with watercolor and you can't get the watercolor up off the paper, so you have to learn to, to turn those mistakes into happy accidents. Um, we're going to do the same thing with charcoal because it leaves a beautiful trace on the drawing. And if I just go in with the eraser and try to, oh, I got all this wrong, and, and try to erase, you're going to smear some of that charcoal deep into the fibers on the paper. And eventually it's going to look dingy and dirty and you won't be able to get it out. So this is what I do with my needle eraser. I go into a point like this, and I will just start. Can you guys see that? You see what I'm doing? I'm just pulling that few of those dark pieces up. Let's say that this line is in the wrong place and I need to get rid of it. I will start to kind of dab at it so it leaves a trace. And then I might put a different line in. And then I'll end up using this beautiful line later. So in here, like it got a little dark up underneath that cheek drawing. Start dabbing at those little pieces. Now your students are going to hate this because it takes forever. They're really going to want to pull out a stump or their finger to really smear. But um, please help them to learn to not do that. <laughs> Great. Um, because again, they're going to have a hard time pulling that up off of the paper. So what I would do once I have enough charcoal down is I would take the hard charcoal and we're going to use this like a blending stump, um, which is that, that piece of paper that's all wrapped up nice and tight. Uh, in, in case you don't know um, that that's one of the terms, I think another is tortillon or something like that. Anyway, um, is that we'll go in and fill in some of those places where the charcoal has been, the soft charcoal has been deposited on the paper. And this hard charcoal is going to drag that charcoal around and start to stain down in the little part of your paper. Here, I'm going to show you a little further along. Do you guys have any questions so far? It's magic. Okay, here we go. So this drawing, I left the um, the shadow areas open as long as I could. Open meaning I didn't commit with the lines. Even now, I really haven't committed with these lines. Uh, if the nose is wrong, I can go back in and erase some of those. But I wanted to show you this is kind of the ghost image that I would get to. And we're we're trying to move a little bit closer so you can see. So sorry for the awkward cameraness. Liz, are you okay if just part of your face is yeah. in the oh, shot? Yeah, we could just clip the whole face. That'd be great. <laughs> yeah, that's good. That's good. Okay. So what I'm going to go ahead and do right now is I'll show you, I'll start working on the nose and show you how I would develop the nose. Um, and then uh, we'll just take it feature by feature. Um, I know already because she's blonde, if you can see in the photo right here, she's blonde. I love, when I took the, the photo in my studio, it has this nice dark background. And I really like that. So eventually I'll put that dark in, but we're not worried too much about her hair right now. So I'm gonna go ahead and put that thing in. Um, before I finish the nose though, I wanna to talk to you about these little places uh, right here kind of show where the hair pulls away from the skull and um, kind of shows the shape of the skull a little bit. Uh, so they need to be in the right place, but also they need to be the right value, the correct value, and they're not right now. Let me show you a quick demo of what value does on, um, on your drawing. So I have my kneaded eraser here. Try to get it in a little more of a ball. And you can see the light uh, from the gallery falling on my needed eraser. There we go, that's, that's mostly. If I go ahead and um, put an eye socket in and I go that far, that is gonna tell you how far back that eye socket goes in by how dark it is. 
Let's go a little, a little deeper. And then if I do the other eye socket and not as deep, you see the shadow differences in this um, kneaded eraser. This one with the darker value looks like it's pushed back into the skull further. So this would be someone with a very prominent forehead and their eyes are really, really recessed. Whereas this one is pulled out a little bit. You can see it's not nearly as dark. And so that has more of an organic, natural uh, look to the eye socket. When your students um, put down their value too dark, this is what they're in effect doing to the portrait is they're pushing that skull back too far or pulling the skull out um, too much. And that is one thing people don't quite always get in the values is that they describe the form absolutely. And so those values have to be spot on. Now, before everybody um, gets too discouraged or whatever, or your students get too discouraged, um, it's really easy to just pull a little bit of that value back out. And right now in the gallery, uh, the value in her eyes on the camera looks pretty light, but actual in actuality, it's actually pretty dark right now. Um, so I'll go ahead and address that later as we go through the eyes. Right now, let's get those, um, that nose done. So I have um, soft charcoal on the underneath side of her nose. This is describing that form under here. But she has obviously, like everybody else, she has a little bit of a bulb to the nose. This is my hard charcoal and I'm kind of smearing around very gently some of that other charcoal that's already on there. I am gonna choke down on it and put a little bit of the dark right around here. I'm going to do that because I want to be able to to uh, my values correctly. And so having a little bit of that dark is going to help me realize how light or dark underneath her nose needs to go. I need to show you guys another tool here pretty quickly. I'm getting a little more soft charcoal in there. I'm realizing I didn't have quite enough to push around the way I'd like to. So that's what I'm doing right now. A little bit of that charcoal in there. The reason that I use the gray paper is that it's a light mid-tone. And then that way um, I can bring highlights out with the chalk and I can push them back in with the, the charcoal to get it darker. If I start on a white paper, a completely white paper, I all of my values have to go down. There's not anything that can go brighter. And I think that that's frustrating to, to people um, also, especially when they're first starting because um, they don't go dark enough or they go way too dark. And then it's, it's really just hard to judge your values. So one thing that I do is I like, I like that paper so that it's got some of that range. Um, I am gonna go ahead and show you another one of my tools that I use. I use paint brushes. I have two of them. These are the only paint brushes in my studio. Oh, I was just gonna say that, but look, that one is marked. Um, my, all my brushes have this red tape on them. I mean, they. It, that means it belongs to Liz Harris because I have students, I did pre-COVID that came in my studio and um, constantly I'd lend them a brush uh, to let them try something out and then the brush would go grow legs and walk away. I have this one, it is a flat, it's a ruby satin that I had bought for oil paint. Um, and then it was just had such a nice texture on the charcoal. The blue tape on there is to remind me that this is only to be used with charcoal. I can't use it for oils. Once you put oils on it, it's useless, as you guys know. Um, this is a, a master's touch, which I think, I don't even know where you buy these anymore. Hobby Lobby maybe. Um, but there, it's just a nice soft synthetic sable, a uh, little tiny round, it's a size zero. What I will use these for, I do not smear with them, but I will tap. Actually, I will smear with this in the hair. 
but I will tap. And so I'll show you right now, I just tap to remove some of the charcoal. Now, why am I using this instead of the um, uh, eraser? The eraser sometimes takes off too much charcoal. So if I want to get down in there and remove a good deal of charcoal, I just get rid of a teeny tiny amount, which right here, the bridge of front, or the, uh, where the ball connects to the column of the nose, I'm just gonna slightly tap because again, like our needed eraser example, the value was too dark. So it was pushing that part of her nose in too far. And so we needed to pull that out just a little bit again. Okay, I'm doing a little transition between our um, shadow plane and if I had more time, I would put in that core shadow on the nose, but um, we're just gonna leave it for now. And I want to, at this point, um, you need to be really careful with your charcoal not to, or your white chalk, not to mix it with your charcoal, because if you mix it with your charcoal, you're going to get um, a pearly gray color that, um, is not good for highlights. It's really great for the white of the eyes. And um, I hope to show you that later. But um, I'm just gonna put a little bit of that. Uh, I feel like I'm shouting. <laughs> Sorry, everybody. I'm gonna put a little bit of that white on there and that's gonna help me judge her nose. Values around her nose is what I meant to say. As soon as something starts to bother you on your paper, take care of it. Um, Richard Schmidt is famous for saying, never leave anything knowingly wrong on your painting or drawing. And there's a lot of truth in that. If you know something is wrong, you need to take care of it immediately or everything else that you're judging by is going to be affected by that, uh, that problem. So if we can see up underneath the nose, I've got this really sharp line from back when I was putting in the basic values. So I'm just gonna kind of dab, dab at that to make that sharp line kind of lessen. You guys, is this too easy? Um, is there, I don't know, is there something else you want me to talk about or talk to, speak to? And feel free just to, to kind of shout it out or, or type in the chat and we'll ask it. You can see here, I'm establishing a really nice dark up underneath her um, jawline back in there. Uh, I kind of like the contrast of it and especially how it will look with her blonde hair. So I'm gonna go ahead and put that in now that will help me judge all the rest of my values. Liz, I have a question that might be helpful for, for some of the teachers on the call. Mm -hmm. Do you have any tips or advice or ideas for, for teaching drawing to an online or hybrid classroom? Um, yes, I have recently been um, putting together some lesson plans for uh, a course that will be coming out on Sentient Academy in January. And part of it is that uh, hybrid classroom. Um, the biggest tip that I can give you is uh, as, the, as the students have the lesson, lesson plan and they work through it, if you can take the time, and I know this is just absolutely crazy with all the students that you guys have and everything that you're going through. If you can take the time to give each student one specific theme that they can really 
um, grab hold of and work on. Um, I find that people, the, the, the students that I've been teaching, which are actually all adults, so I'm so sorry, I don't have anything specific to uh, junior high or high school kids, but get them one specific thing that they can change that will help to increase um, just kind of the, the beauty and the expression of the art that they're doing, but also will increase their skill set. So for example, um, I have a one lesson plan where we talk about value and I actually have a, a sheet that I, I drew out and then they download it and they print it out and then they play with the values on the lines I've already done so that they don't have to think about the drawing. They literally are just learning about the value. And then we go to, okay, take a picture um, that looks just like the one or close enough to the one that I gave you and try that all over again. Um, one thing that I would say is that drawing from life is one of the harder things that we do. It's absolutely necessary, but it's very, very difficult. And so, um, a lot of people get really discouraged by, uh, you know, do the self-portrait from life at home. That is one of the toughest things that uh, my students end up having to do. And I used to have it at the beginning of my curriculum with the, the drawing, but now um, the do a self-portrait is at the end where I've taught them how to do the values and how to draw an eye or a nose or, or a mouth or whatever. I don't know, did that help at all? That probably didn't help any of you guys, I'm sorry. It's, um, it's tough to know what each of your students need when they're online. And so one of the things that I've been having my students do is uh, do their practice and then just, um, they'll snap a picture of it and they'll just text it to me. I used to do over email, but I don't, my email inbox gets insanely full and like everybody else's and I don't really check it very often. Okay, let's see. We've got both of those. Are your students, let me ask you guys something. Are your students interested in doing self-portraits or not really, or any kind of portraits? You can't even do like a thumbs up if they are interested in self-portraits. I do portraits with my kids. The very last thing I do with them in junior high. Good for you. We got two, a couple other thumbs up from some of the other teachers. I, I'm really excited that you guys are doing that. I would have loved a portrait class when I was in junior high and high school. Um, my, uh, I went to junior high and high school in Texas and um, my teachers were uh, really interested in cattle. We painted a lot of cattle. <laughs> so I, I think portraiture is kind of fun. This is just further along those same stages, just going back and forth with the hard charcoal and the soft charcoal. I would, in a finished piece, I would go ahead and resolve that mouth um, but I wanted to get you guys uh, a little bit of time with um, me doing the eyes, hair, and then uh, background. If hopefully that will help you, be, a, be of most uh, help to you. You can see right here, let me see if you can see. And yeah, oh, go ahead. Too. Um, Leslie's saying she can see some questions in the chat that I can't see. Leslie, do you want to ask them and listen? Oh, that'd be great. Those? Yeah. They're just comments. Um, Let's see. Melanie says that it scares them to death. And Jana Marie says yes, but it's so they're so intimidated by it. Do you have any tips for making it less intimidating, Liz? I do. I have a couple of tips for that. So the first one would be um, have them do someone famous. It is easier for them to see a likeness in someone that they, uh, you know, other people could recognize as well. So someone famous, again, the straight on headshot is best. And I have this in color. I'm gonna go ahead and change it really fast to black and white. Um, although I would not recommend this for advanced students, I think that first time students, this is 
uh, or you know, even up through their first couple of projects, changing something to black and white just makes it so much easier to begin with, um, not having to guess where the values are quite as much. Oh, you guys, I have a few tools for you. You might want to download. Now, you guys probably already know these. I'm probably the one that's late to the party, but I'm going to show them on my phone. And I can share the link in the chat, Liz, too. Oh, that'd be perfect. Can you guys see this one right here? It's called Layout. You see the icon? Let me pull it up for you. Layout is awesome because you can see my photo booth um, when I was doing these earlier today. So this is uh, something I wanted to show you guys for, I was looking at my blonde daughter and um, wanted to try to find a way that the students that I'm teaching online right now, uh, just, just kind of how they could interpret it. So one of the assignments was um, to find blonde, um, hang on, let me go back to that picture so you guys can see to find blonde charcoal drawings um, that they might like. And uh, this is one someone came up with, this is a Casey Baugh, I don't know, can you guys see it? Casey Baugh exa example of how to do a blonde, um, there we go, a blonde portrait. And I think that that helps the students too, to see a rendition of what it is that they're going to draw. Kind of an idea, here is another blonde portrait. Um, this one I pinned a long time ago to share with my um, my students, but this is again another Casey Bond. It's a different way that he interpreted uh, a blonde. So that might be a, a good resource source for your students to be able to find examples of this is the way I want my my drawing to look. Okay, so right now I have in layout. Uh, I can choose different ways to lay it out. I'm gonna choose this one right here. So this is uh, the example side and right here um, I could do, you know, like, um, I could do my drawing on the other side to see how it's coming. I mean, this is not obviously, I, I'm not doing this for myself, but that is one thing that I have my students do. So they can kind of see how it's coming. The other great thing about this is then, I can also um, just replace it with the photo that I'm using and see side by side. How's it going? What do I want to change? You can see that I made her chin a lot darker. Um, I'm going to show you if we have enough time how I pull those lights out of the chin because I want to keep them still in the shadow area. Um, more on the shadow end, uh, that tr transitional place. Um, but then if they have, depending on what phone they have, I have a shortcut set up on my phone where it turns it black and white so I can see right next to each other. So this, this drawing is from earlier today. Anyway, I feel like that's a really good tool for the kids to use. Um, you know, eventually it'll become a crutch. So it's probably not something that as professional artists we want to use very often. But um, for the kids, I think it's a great tool. Absolutely great tool. The other tool, if you guys don't know about this one, um, I highly recommend it. It's called Art Tools and it's gonna have this little A on here. Oh, sorry, that's a, pa that's a painting I'm doing. <laughs> I'll show that to you guys in a second. Um, so Art Tools is great because you can, um, go into your gallery and add the photo that you're using. You see that? And then they can see where they wanna put it on the paper. Again, I, I wouldn't really use this for a quick drawing. I use it more for really big paintings that are getting kind of intimidating, but it has some cool features in that over here. They can pick what frame size they're gonna be doing the drawing in. So if you have an assignment that's an eight by 10, they can stick it in the eight by 10 one, which is right here. And they can figure out how they wanna put it on the page. Um, it's just a slick little tool for them to be able to say exactly where do I wanna put it on the page kind of a thing. And then it does have a grid on there, but I, I don't, sorry. They always have ads that pop up, I guess, cause it's free. 
but um, they have different grids on there that you can use. I don't use grids because uh, I, they don't work for me. It, they just make me be too tight when I'm drawing and not get to the essence of the drawing. Um, I remember doing them in school and um, for me, it was like eating your green beans, but um, I know that for a lot of people, they're super helpful. And um, I guess you never know which way your students are gonna go if, they, if it's easier for them to use a grid or if they're more expressive and shape driven rather than line driven. Okay, so those are some of the tools that I would use and some of the tips that I, that I use for my students. And then Liz, I, I want to keep drawing if you can. I don't want to keep you, stop you from drawing, but we had one teacher who teaches commercial art, so doing more digital. Uh, they work with Illust Adobe Illustrator a lot. Mm, yeah. um, what if about um, charcoal drawing could maybe translate to a commercial art classroom or working more in a graphic design? Um, I've, I've never done commercial art before, but um, but I do know that these are the um, principles that are going to make their commercial art better in any way, shape, or form, depending on, you know, how how realistic they want it to look. Um, I have several friends who have been uh, illustrators for uh, different movie studios, et cetera, and um, they all have great foundational skills in drawing and value. Um, I used to draw uh, pre-pandemic, we used to do a paint drawing group once a week um, in the evenings. And a lot of those illustrators would come and practice these skills because then as they, as they do their digital rendering, et cetera, um, they understand what light and form does. Um, and they understand when it's wrong too. And they understand what things kind of um, I don't know, do together. I would say look at David Dibble's work for that. He was, uh, did a lot of digital work, still does in, at the early stages of his paintings, but his paintings are just so incredibly strong because he has an understanding of the natural world because he's painted outdoors for years and years and years. I, and, they, and I don't know how the students feel about that, if they just want to get done with it and, and go on to um, their digital tools, but uh, understanding the way that the, that the brush works, I think would help them a great deal. But again, I, I haven't done any work in that area, so. Now this is an area where I had shadow in, but apparently, I mean, you can see, I don't know if you guys can see this. Let me increase her a little bit. Does that help? Yes, it does. Okay. You guys can see in this area, there's a lot more light than what I have on the drawing. So um, now that I have that, that shape right at the beginning, um, let me just see. Let me see if I can get a little closer to the drawing. Sorry, I'm not good at this. Okay, there we go. You can see in here that there's all that shadow in there and that's gotta come out. Um, and I know that, and that's why I use soft charcoal uh, when I put it in because I knew that that would become an issue. There we go. Um, so I'll go ahead and just pull that out really quickly. While we're here. Do you want me to try and get the camera and the table that close, Liz? Um, if that would be beneficial for everyone, does everybody want that? I think you could see it a little bit better. Tell me. Oh, I have another tip to share with you guys. I'm gonna get in the screen now really fast. Okay. Um, the black screen is really helpful when you're teaching um, your students how to see different shapes. 
So um, what I will do is I will have my image open on the laptop or when I'm drawing or painting from life, I will have um, the model just right beyond my um, easel so that I can see both at the same time. And if you will put the um, camera up like this or the black screen up like this and look up into the black screen and you can, if you'll put it so that you have both your drawing on one side and the model or the picture on the other side, if you will look up and flick your eye back and forth between the two, you can see value problems much better. If you go to the side, so look in the side of your camera or on your screen, obviously pointed towards what you're looking at, then you can see drawing issues better. So that's another quick tip for everybody. What I do find though, is if you do a side-by-side -side photo of um, both the, uh, you, you've got a photo that has both this and the reference in the frame, that the camera will pick up the value scheme of one or the other, it won't pick up both. So you'll end up making your drawing either too light or too dark, depending on which one your camera focused in on and picked up on. So right now I'm just lifting out some of those lights that come right in this area right here. And across the bottom rim of her eyelid is catching light. So I'm gonna be pulling some of that out as well. You guys see that from here to this one right here. And it's really, so dark, the eye just becomes part of this shadow shape. So if I were drawing from life, I would be able to see into that shadow and maybe would put some of that in, but I can't see it in the photo. And so I'm gonna just put it in. Um, when I was uh, learning, um, I spent a lot of time in charcoal, in graphite, then charcoal, then black and white paint, and then um, limited palette paint, and then um, full palette. Um, and so as I was going through each one of those, I um, realized I wasn't learning as much as I wanted to in charcoal. And so um, I went ahead and offered um, on my Instagram page, a very, very low price, like insanely low price for people to let me um, do charcoal portraits of their family. And I ended up doing with that 20 charcoal portraits and I had a very, I don't know, just kind of dumb, shot myself in the foot and had to have them all delivered within like a month and a half. And that I think was what really helped me the most was having that many charcoal portraits have to be delivered so quickly. So there is also value in not only taking a drawing through the finish, but there's also value in uh, having a time limit for your students. And Liz, I, mm -hmm. we've gotten some feedback that you've been closer, can maybe be more helpful. So I might just hold this close to you all. Sure. Sure. Yeah. That's not, no. It, it, yeah, it's fine. It doesn't bother me. Um, when you are thinking about eye color, so a lot of times you'll see these tutorials and they put in all of the muscles that are in the uh, the iris and you would most likely not see that muscular striation. And so as you're, you're drawing it in, my daughter has green eyes. And so there is some lightness in that muscular striation. I will just barely put it in and hint at it. And it looks more realistic than if I went in and put in every single um, muscle piece, if that makes sense. So as far as the how to draw stuff, I don't know, do you guys have, 
do you have books that you can use in the classroom or is it pretty much just and one of the teachers liz is asking are you working with the harder charcoal now yes that's the hard charcoal and the blue one is the soft um in case you guys need some reference for how to draw things i know um, a lot of students want to know all of the musculature and bone structure underneath. It does help to know what you're looking at, but the most important skill is to learn to copy what it is that you're, look, you're seeing. And if you can learn that skill, then just because you don't know the name of the muscle, you should be able to draw it. But just in case, um, I think I want to say that I bought um, a quick download from an artist named David Casson. He has this little booklet of renderings of eyes, nose, eyes, nose mouth, etc. All the muscle and the bone underneath, and those were um, some good, uh, not only illustrations, but there were a few things that I went ahead and drew so that I understood what it was I was looking at. I want to say that download was like five, ten dollars. Um, I bought it about two years ago. So David Casson, K-A-S-S-A-N. That was a resource that I used to uh, to learn all that muscular. And what was the title of that again, Liz? Um, I don't know. I think David has it listed on his website as how to draw facial features. I think that's literally what it is. And it is just a download. You download it and print it. Um, but th that has been helpful. And so maybe for some of your students who really want to uh, learn more, that might be a helpful little tool. Or you could download it yourself and then, um, you know, put, put together different lesson plans. I mean, I, I feel like I'm telling you guys how to do stuff. You do so much better than me anyway. So I'm not really sure if any of this is helping. I'm just throwing everything out there and hopefully something will, will uh, be important to you. Yeah, we have about 13 minutes left. If there's any other questions or things you'd want um, Liz to talk about, we would love to get it. And I'll, I'm putting um, David Casson's website in the links or in the chat. If you guys want to, I'm going to go ahead and finish this drawing today. I'll probably post it tomorrow or the day after on Instagram. You guys can see, I'll, I'll include a bunch of close-ups on there. So you guys can kind of see what my final resolution of each of these pieces was. I want to show you how I do use the gray charcoal to do the pupils, or I mean the whites of the eyes. So I know that a common problem that I've seen in my students is that the white of the eye, they'll make it really, really white. And then it looks like their eyes have been photoshopped and they're kind of glowing and a little demonic almost. They have to, your students have to remember that the ball of the eye sits back in the eye socket. You see that all that shadow. So if I have something that's white, still that white of the eye is going to be darker. Um, let me just pull out a little bit. You see she's got this lovely little piece of white blonde hair. I'll just stick it in there so we have a little bit of reference. That is the brightest thing that's on this photo and it's not the whites of the eyes. And so I've got some charcoal already down in those eyes right now. And I'll just go in with a little bit of the chalk. Now I'm barely touching the surface, barely tickling the surface. And it is starting to turn a little bit gray. See how that white is just raising the value a little bit lighter? And that is too dark. So I will go back in with the hard charcoal and put a little hard charcoal over the top. And what that does is it now not only put the value back where it is, but if you could see it in person, it has a nice gray white to the eye. Um, it gives that illusion of a white of the eye. 
while we're talking about this too, I want to talk about the catch light that goes down in, um, that would be somewhere usually on the pupil. Um, the catch lights are usually actually much darker than people put them in. Uh, because again, that ball of the eye is set back in the eye cavity. And so the light is having to kind of hit it in an infused manner, unless you have that, that light right up against the eyeball, and then you'll have this bright glowing eyeball. And um, I don't know, that might not be so attractive, but hang on, I just have to not knowingly leave anything wrong on my drawing. So that catch light as it goes back down into the eye, you want to make sure that it's not that bright when you put it in. And that's another great tip to give your students is to help them understand that it's not very bright. So in this photo, you can see the catch lights because the, the light is so high up on her head and is hitting her forehead right about here. That's about where it's hitting. Um, it's hitting right about there. And so it's barely peeking underneath her eyelids, etc. So it's just very faint in there. And then this one is even more faint. Um, but that eye needs all kinds of drawing help right now. Um, Uh, what was I going to tell you? Where you put that catch light in the eye defines the form and where that light bulb is when you're looking at it. So if your students are putting it in the wrong spot, it's going to define her eye incorrectly or their eye incorrectly. I can't remember if I said this earlier, so I apologize to everyone. When you have your students do their self portrait, I would recommend teaching them how to use like a Rembrandt lining or something. Rembrandt lining, as you recall, comes from the side and it lights one half of the face very, very well. And then there's a lovely little triangle right there. That will give them more shapes to be able to um, uh, latch onto as they're drawing rather than uh, normally they'll just take a selfie or they're standing in front of the mirror and it's fully lit from the front like this. And um, as I said in the beginning, this is kind of a, a harder lighting situation. Um, her eyebrows are mostly dark, actually, even though she's a blondie. And um, they have this little sparse spot right up here in the top. And I want to make sure I get that. Now, you notice I have yet to go in there and actually draw lines for an eyebrow. And I feel like that is what a lot of people do, is that your students will go like this. I'll go, oh, well, I've got an eyeball and I've got this lid that goes over the top of it. And then I have the recess and then I have my eyebrow that goes over the top and I'll just do a bunch of lines and I'll call that good. Um, the reason I don't, I just kind of mass is then you're gonna start to look like you've got eyebrow in there without having to draw all of the, the pieces. And if you need to go in and pull a piece out, you can like that. And you can also go a little darker in that area. And we'll give the illusion of the eyebrows without them actually drawing every single piece. Same with eyelashes. Uh, you'll see them put a lot of eyelashes on there. But when you read that, that eye very quickly, it's usually just a quick lash line and you might have one or two showing in there. Um, I hope this was helpful. Do you guys have any last minute questions? Um, while you're asking, I'm gonna just quickly show you how I use this block of charcoal.
If you've done the drawing the right way, this will be fun, this part. You'll get to do all kinds of expression because everything will be in the right place. And yeah, if you have any other questions for Liz, chat them to us. We'll, we'll ask them in these last couple of minutes. And this whole training we will post on our YouTube and our, and our website. And so if you wanna revisit anything that Liz was teaching or, or look at the drawing again, this will be up uh, probably by next Monday, but hopefully earlier. Oops, I don't know where that went, so we will switch. Uh, one of our teachers, Lisa, said, thank you so much, it's beautiful. Oh, I'm glad, thank you. I hope it was helpful. I have a question, Liz, maybe in just these last couple of minutes. Do you mm -hmm. have any tips for helping, helping students see like what you were kind of showing how people might draw an eye if they're just thinking about the shapes of an eye, but for them to really see from either a source image or from life, the nuance, like in, that, in your daughter's eyebrow where there's that spot with the spark hair. How do, you, mm -hmm. how do you develop that skill in students of really that close looking, not seeing? Um, I think that you have to kind of point it out. I mean, even as an adult, I had to have teachers point things out to me as I was taking, uh, taking art to go ahead and draw something and then have, um, I studied, I did a mentorship for a few years with Casey Childs. And, um, you know, if I started like that, sorry about that, guys. If I started like this, then Casey would say, all right, now try massing that whole shape. <laughs> now you guys can't go and erase on your students' work because they're at home. But maybe what you wanna do is do a digital, um, does everybody have the capability to do a digital paint over or draw over with an iPad? Um, that would be an easy way. Um, you can do it on, um, uh, sorry, just drop that eraser. You can do it on um, just the phone too. If I got, let me show you guys. A lot of times I feel like you just have to be shown things. So let's say that I have this drawing right here. I'll go closer. This is an older version, right? That I did this morning. I have this drawing here and let's say we can tell that there needs to be more light on her chin, which I haven't fixed yet, but we're gonna run out of time. You could get this from a student. They could just send it to your phone and then um, I, I use markup, just edit. Um, let's see, markup right here. I think this is different depending on what your phone is, but you could just do right here and say, lighten this area. And you guys are probably doing all of this, so I'm sorry if it's not helpful, but this is what I do to my students. I'll even take white and just go this area. Well, that was really nice and neat, but I would try to do it better than that. I would say this area needs to be lighter. That makes sense. So um, I think a lot of times they just need to be shown. And then if you have time to show them all different um, uh, examples of um, different ways different artists handled it. Let me give you guys a list of charcoal portrait artists that I think have different things to offer. Um, you guys know all about John Singer Sargent, I'm sure um, the drawings are, are also really beneficial. Um, I love Nikolai Fashion. Um, just beautiful, beautiful drawings. Um, and those even, you could have students copy those just to learn how to move the charcoal around. 
that was one of the assignments that I did while I was learning was um, a Nikolai Fession copy. Um, with your kneaded eraser, I just want to show you really fast. Um, you can turn it into any tool that you want. And so right now, I'm just going to go ahead and pull some of these highlights out of this area because this is where the, the light is really hitting in earnest. And I've done all this prep work so that as I pull some of these pieces out, they're going to just make this beautiful, more realistic hair looking. And if I had more charcoal down here, I'd pull some of that. Um, when I first started charcoal, I was so afraid to make any kind of errant mark. And I think your students probably will be as well. So if you can have an assignment where they're just kind of playing around with the textures like this, um, that would be really helpful. Okay, more of the charcoal artists that I love. I uh, love David Casson's work. It's very, very tight though. And I love uh, Casey Baugh. He has a nice expression of how he puts the charcoal down. Oh, and um, with Casey Baugh, he'll have like a splattering. One of those drawings I showed you has like splattering. That is actually acetone in a squirt bottle. So you probably don't want to have your students doing that. But, um, but there are other ways to make, uh, make texture on there. Um, let me and think. Liz, I mm -hmm. think our time is up. Ah, we're done. And so and Leslie at the, that, from the museum is gonna share the link in the chat features that you need to, um, it's gonna be a link to a survey that you need to complete to get your reimagined teaching certificate. Um, while you're doing that, Liz will probably just stay on here and, and draw. And if you have additional questions for her, I'm sure she'd be happy to answer that. But before Absolutely. you leave, Please fill out that survey. If you do not fill out the survey, you will not get your certificate. And thank you for joining us. And thank you especially for your patience at the beginning as we were having all sorts of internet problems here at the museum. We, we really appreciate your patience with us. Thank you everybody for, for listening. <laughs> and again, I'll have um, on my, uh, Instagram at Liz Harris Art. I will have this finished drawing with some close ups so you guys can see what I did. And hopefully, if this is of, of help to you, if you have questions, please leave them in the comments section under the drawing, and I'll go ahead and try to get to all of those so that I can be of the most uh, service to you guys. And we had a couple of people clap, and someone in the chat said, Thanks so much for this opportunity. Oh, thank you, you guys. Appreciate it.
fun. I am terrible at reading my email, so maybe a while before I <laughs> Me I and Liz were it. just talking. Um, Liz and I were just talking on mute for or for a moment, and she said that if you have any questions, you're welcome to email her, um, and I'm going to put her email in the chat, and um, you can also, like she said earlier, find her on Instagram and, and contact her that way. Melanie, I will move the camera right now to get a little bit closer look and see if we can even maybe move the camera a little bit closer. And Jeannie Marie said, thanks so much. Beautiful. Love the idea of seeing shape more than line. This was the perfect reminder. Mm, thank you. And Melanie, I'll try and move that camera right now. It's kind of shaky when I hold it. But... And I like, and it's like mirrored on my screen, so I'm about to figure it out. You know, here, do you want me to come close? Yeah, do you want to? 
And you guys, I will put um, close up photos on my Instagram so you can see. Can you see a, what a mess the hair is? Oops, no, you can't. You notice that lovely piece right there is because I have a line on my drawing board. Can you see that? And so it gave me that right there. So that'd be something that I'll just hit with uh, an eraser. Oh, there we go. That's better. This is so hard. <laughs> Who knew it would be this hard? And you can see up in the forehead, I didn't really get there. I need a little more value up in there and I'll make sure I get that on before I put it online. So you can see that it's kind of a mess up close. I don't know, can everybody hear me? Um, but far away, it gives the right, hopefully it gives the right illusion. Is that helpful? Does anyone want another close up or is that good? Melanie says, thank you so much and wow. Oh, that's so nice. <laughs> And after you finish the survey, you're totally free to leave the meeting. We'll probably stay on until about 5.15 and then we'll, we'll disconnect.
everything there so wrong that I'm like, oh my gosh, I left a bomb there. <laughs> well, it's the way it goes. Well, thank you everyone for joining. We're going to end the meeting now. Thank you. And um, if you'd like to revisit it, look for the, the link on our website and YouTube soon. Thank you.